All right. Are we ready? Yes. So just a couple of um, admin intro details as we kind of kick off our new new series this year. We got a lot of new people here tonight, so I just want to kind of go over a few things. Those of you that have been here a hundred times, you can doze off for just a minute. But um, if you've been to Engage before, welcome back. Always glad to see everybody here. Um, and if you're new, welcome as well. I hope you feel very loved on tonight. Um, this is we, we don't do a lot of events in our women's ministry. Uh, we want everything we do to be very intentional, very focused. And so mu- much of the stuff we do is geared around Bible studies or small groups or mentorships one-on-one um, and those kind of things. And then we do engage six times a year where we invite anybody that wants to come, all women, to come gather together, um, hear teaching, um, kind of pick a topic that is what we feel is applicable to what we're going through in our lives, and then also just meet each other. This is a good connecting point. If you're walking through Providence for the first time and you're new, it can be a little bit daunting to really find a way, how can I get connected? What do I have to do to meet people? So this is a good meeting point. Um, Because we only do it six times a year, obviously this is not and cannot function as the only thing that you do to spiritually grow. So we also have a year-long reading plan that we really put out there and say, if you don't have anything else going on, if you have something else, then great. As long as you're in God's word and you have community around you, then that's great. But if you don't, we offer the reading plan. So like right now in the reading plan, we're doing um, a study on covenants. So we actually are offering that as an in-person study or online as well. So um, we just want to help you get connected. We, we want Providence to feel more like a home and not like a business, not like something you come in and out of without getting to know people. Because as you're going to hear today in what we talk about, um, relationships are really, really important. So I knew, thank you for those of you that came in tonight, wide-eyed, like, I don't know somebody, where should I go? It's difficult to walk in a room and not really know and be connected to somebody else. So I'm glad you're here. Hopefully you'll make some good connections tonight. Um, our theme verse for the past few years I haven't changed it because it just sticks with me. I just love it. So it's Jeremiah 29, 13. It says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So that's what we wanna do, put Jesus as a focus and kind of seek him. So our new series is called Different by Design, about God's purpose for women. So my heart is to empower all of us to walk um, in a manner that's worthy of the calling that God's placed in our life. And I do believe that it's a really, really high calling And I also believe that the stakes are higher now really than ever before. Um, I would argue that right now the enemy is making a concerted effort to strip away the very fabric of what it is to be a woman. Um, That's why this topic, I had a different topic chosen. And then throughout the fall, as I was talking with someone that I really trust about um, topics, we came up with this one and I was like, this has got to be it because it's just so relevant. Um, For those of you that don't know, there has never been um, a more difficult time right now to be a young girl especially. So the past 10 to 15 years, studies have been done in the UK and then also here, and there is a 5,000% increase, and you heard that number correctly, a 5,000% increase in transgenderism and gender dysphoria, but only in girls. The spike is not happening in boys. They're the ones early on that struggled more often with dysphoria, And their numbers have kind of gone up and down, but very much stayed close to the bar that they're on. If you look at bar graphs or statistical charts about these studies, the line for girls just goes from here and goes straight up to the top of the graph. It has skyrocketed. And and what's the message? Well, they're being sold a lie that they're gonna be most satisfied and most happy when they're no longer a woman. What a devastating thought that your womanhood, your femininity, you being a female is a negative and you need to strip that away to be happy. And womanhood is under attack, just the very idea, our language is being changed all over the place. Bills are being passed to change language. And I'm not even talking about the issue of pronouns. And so it's really important for us to know what we believe, why we believe it, that it's based in scripture, based in God's word and what he says about us. And I promise you right now, I think that the targeted attack right now on women, on girls is because we are a threat to the enemy. I really believe that. 
Women play a very big role in contending against spiritual warfare and spiritual things. Women have always, um, there's statistics done a lot of times in churches where there's usually a higher percentage of women that go even without husbands because women lately have become more of the spiritual leaders in their home. That's got to change too, but I'm not here to talk about men. Chad can do that. Um, so we're, gonna, we're just going to evaluate God's design. We're going to recognize that our differences are good, that they're intentional and they have purpose in them. Now, some of you might be sitting here tonight going, oh, you know what, I don't really feel feminine. I never really have. And you're talking to the key leader of that little uh, box that you're in, okay? Tomboy my whole life, played sports my whole life, um, never felt feminine. All through high school was the girl with the dirty bun on the head and the, and the sweatpants and the tennis shoes. Like never wore dresses, never did that kind of stuff. So I get you, but here's my thing. I think the answer is not that I should have been a boy. I think the answer is let's broaden our spectrum of what femininity is. Femininity doesn't have to be pink and Barbies and those kind of things. We can broaden that up and go, women can be a lot of different things. I can have masculine traits. I do have masculine traits. That doesn't make me a boy or a man. That makes me a female that has masculine traits. And so we just need to broaden that idea and not be so narrow in our scope of what we're defining a woman as. So hopefully that will come out as well. But I've I've compiled a video of two different um, TikTokers and I wanna just show you, not to scare you, if your kids are on TikTok, you should be checking their phones constantly for sure. Um, But I just think it's ironic. These are gonna be two trans men. For those of you that um, wanna know what that is, that is a biological man that has or is in the process of transitioning to be a woman. And they're gonna be talking about what it is to be a woman. Okay, so let's show that video. Day one of being a girl, and I have already cried three times. I wrote a scathing email that I did not send. I ordered dresses online that I couldn't afford. And then uh, when someone asked me how I was, I said, I'm fine, but I wasn't fine. How'd I do, ladies? Good? Girl power. Hi, I don't have a uterus. I'm non-binary, and I wanted to say something about trans-inclusive language and abortion. Thank you. What I see people doing is using the word women when they mean women and using the word people who need abortion services when they mean people who need abortion services. They are technically two different things and I would hope that we all wouldn't want to push linguistically for birthing and pregnancy to be synonymous with womanhood for a lot of reasons. So (laughs) trans-inclusive language doesn't erase anyone. I want to be real clear. I'm not making fun of either of those people. I think it's incredibly sad. I think it's incredibly sad. And I also think what he said at the very end is ironic because it is erasing women. (laughs) It absolutely is. And even to the point where there's people that are winning high school like crowns that are a boy. Like at this point, we've got boys that are better at being women than women are. And that should make us kind of take a step back and go, if they're willing to speak out, then we really have to evaluate what we believe and why. And we have to be able to do it with grace and compassion and love. We're not here to bang people in the head or like push our agenda through. We're just here to go, do we really know what we believe it means to be a woman and where it came from? What is our beliefs rooted in? Where's the foundation of why we believe what we believe? That's why I think it's so important to go right back to scripture. Now, this is the longest intro ever, and I'm actually gonna do a little game to wake us up before I go in any deeper. But I wanna tell you now, the very last engaged session is gonna be a panel discussion. And so I want you throughout the year, any questions you have, we're gonna be dealing with a lot of different topics that, you know, are are tense or controversial. We're not all gonna leave here agreeing on every single thing we talk about this year. But if you have questions and you wanna submit them, email me, well, you know, whatever, give them to me. However you wanna do them, save them, because I'd love to use them for the panel discussion at the end as we kind of close out this series, which I'm really excited about. Okay, Um, I also wanna, I wanna be really clear on my intentions about this. Okay, I'm kind of like, you know, buffering the way so I don't 
um, get into an offensive territory. I'm not here to elevate women beyond what God intends so that we squash men. I have no desire to do that, okay? Um, I'm here so that we are not less, seeking less than what God has put out for us, okay? So I'm not here to be like, I'm the new feminist, girl power, and we're gonna get rid of the icky guys. Like, we need them and we're gonna see that tonight, right? So it's a both, it's, we, we work together, there's mutuality here. This is not, we're gonna raise ourselves up by pushing men down. That actually doesn't raise us up at all, it hurts society, okay? So we're not elevating women, we're not gonna swing the pendulum just because there have been times, even in the church and in modern society, where women have been denigrated or treated as less than. That is true at times, of course. What we don't wanna do is swing the pendulum the other way and go beyond what scripture tells us the dignity and value of women is. We wanna sit right in the middle and have a balanced view of just what God says. I think that's really important. Okay, but we are all different and I love to kind of like show you and for my own sake as well, our differences. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a little bit of a, of a I'm gonna give you two options and I'm gonna tell one group to stand up and one group to stay seated depending on which one you identify more with. Now, there is a disclaimer. For those of you that are like, I don't know, I'm, I'm, like, I'm both, I'm, sometimes I'm this and sometimes I'm that, just pick. <laughs> just pick one, pick one, pick one, which one best describes you the majority of the time. And make it quick, because we're going to move through these fairly quickly. I don't have time for you to think about it. Okay. So the first group, I want you to stand up. The second group, stay seated. If you are an extrovert, stand up. Introvert, stay seated. Introverts, you're welcome. I did not put you on the spot. Ooh, look around the room. Isn't this interesting? I love it. Introverts and extroverts, we're different. Okay, sit down. This is our like, get our food worked out. Turn your Apple Watch on and it can count as a workout. Okay, um, if you are spontaneous, stay seated. If you're a planner, stand up. Ooh. Oh, my spontaneous people, we are few in number. Okay, okay, I got you though, I got you though. Okay, sit down. Okay, if you would consider yourself, these are not negative by the way, these are just differences. If you consider yourself more emotional versus logical, emotional ones, stand up. You're more emotional, logical, stay seated. This really helps me. Did you get that on the camera? I want a list of all the emotional women. I wanna make sure I got you. Okay, sit down. Okay, this one's fun, right? Lake cabin, stay seated, beach house, stand up. Okay, okay, good, good, good. I like it, sit down. This is a good one, are you ready? Okay, if you consider yourself an optimist, stand up. Pessimist, stay seated. Mm. There's a lot of you that are wrong in this room. It's fine, it's fine. Okay, sit down. Okay, if you consider yourself like um, a peacemaker, non-confrontational, I want you to stay seated. And if you're the truth teller, confrontational, stand up. Okay, hold on, I really, I really stand up, you are. Heather, get up. You don't get to do the squats. I'm like, I'm, like, I'm a peace, no, I'm comfort, no, I'm peacemaker. Stand up, just stand up, you're fine. Okay, good, 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 I like it. Okay, sit down. All right, all right, this one, I'm gonna give you a second to think about it. Class clown, most likely to succeed. And if you're most likely to succeed, stand up. Who's my clowns? Nice. Good, good, good. That's, okay, there's a few clowns in there. Good, good, good. All right, sit down. Two more, two more. This one's good. Brianna, you can stay seated on this one. If you are a book lover, stay seated. Movie lover, stand up. I know, I know, movies and books, but come on. You know who you are if you're a book lover. Okay, good, okay, good, good, good. Sit down, last one, last one, okay. If you are a type A leader, stand up. If you're a laid back team player, stay seated. Type A's, stand up. Nice. Good, good, good. I like it. I like it. Okay, okay, sit down. I just, 
The one thing I love when you think about all of us in this room is that we are full of different gifts, talents, unique abilities, different drive, different perspectives. And I think that is so crucial to the body of Christ, but also to any of your networks that you are in. Anywhere you have contact with anybody, who you are is important and what you do in those areas makes a difference, especially when you come with who you are and you are proud of your gifts and proud of the way God has made you to be. So I love that. Thank you for kind of letting me do that. Okay, are you ready? We're gonna dive into the uh, origins of God's creation story. So it just seemed appropriate that since we're talking about God's design, of course, you know, we're gonna go back to the very beginning. We're gonna go back to the Genesis story. Um, So if you do have your Bibles with you, you can open and turn to Genesis chapter one. I'm not gonna make you stand up if you brought your Bibles, but I am watching. Who actually opened your Bibles? It's not my problem that you don't actually bring your Bible to where you're gonna be reading God's word. We'll talk about that later. Okay, before we start, let me say just one thing. If you do step back, okay, if you step back and view the Bible as one whole story, in other words, yes, there are individual stories throughout, but really it's telling one grandiose story the beginning to the end, you can see that from Genesis to Revelation, we, Revelation, we start with wholeness. It leads to brokenness. And then after a winding, weaving, long, twisty journey, we see the world restored and redeemed to permanent wholeness. And this is important because what we wanna see from that journey is that how things are in the beginning gives us a glimpse of how things are gonna be at the end, although way, 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 way better at the end. But it is a glimpse. And since we're gonna be talking tonight about the way things were prior to brokenness, I just want us to kind of keep that perspective in mind that what we're gonna be looking at tonight is sinless. This is before the fall, this is before the brokenness, and so we're looking at a really, really good design by God. That's important. Um, There are also, I don't know if you know this or not, There are many, many creation origin stories out there that are not from the Bible, that actually predate Moses' account. I've got a picture of one of them. It's called the Enuma Elish. This version is from the Sumerian era, Mesopotamians, and belonged to the Babylonians, right? So this is one of the ones that predates, and there are some similarities. I use this one example. There are a few of them. For example, both accounts happen over a period of seven days. And they both involve the idea of going from disorder, chaos, to order and calm. Okay, they have that in that as well. Both accounts also involve the origins and creation of the first human, okay? But there is a huge distinction in the Genesis account that sets it apart from all others. And this is really important. In an ancient world of patriarchy and male domination, the living God comes to Moses and gives him a very different creation story to write and give his people. Most accounts don't even include the creation of woman, most. The very, very few that do, it's not good. It's not a good account. The Genesis account is the only account that actually has the creation of woman where she's got value and honored and dignity. So it is really set apart in any of the ancient literature type of world, okay? Now, I'm hoping, I don't need to say this, but I'm gonna say it just in case. We believe the Genesis account is the real account. Okay, just just making sure, okay? Um, But when we we see the time period that God was speaking into, we realize that Moses wrote the Genesis account during after the Israelites were freed from Egypt. So we're talking 1400 BC-ish, give or take, a couple hundred years on either side, okay? That's when this is written. Think about what was happening. It's a whole generation of Israelites. They were there for 400 years, right? So a lot of them lived and died in Egypt. So the generation that makes it out of Egypt only knew Egyptian culture. Egypt has an origin story by their gods. So they're only raised knowing who they are through the eyes of Egyptian gods. So can you, can you think about what God was doing when he comes to Moses and gives him this, it's almost like, hey, let me give you the real account because I want you to take it 
to my people and I want them to know who they are, where they came from, and what their identity is and how, most of all, it's gonna be connected to God. That's gonna be huge. So I really, that's one of those things where when we read our Bibles, history is important. Knowing the cultural context of when Moses wrote that and what was happening with Israel and how meaningful this message would be, they were slaves. Some of them would have been orphans. And yet God's going, I'm gonna give you a rich heritage that's based in design and purpose by me. That would have been very powerful to a group of slaves coming out of that generation. Now, I'm sure that we've also heard that, and you've heard me say it tonight, we need to read things in cultural context. We need to know the history, the original language, those kind of things. But what we read tonight, even though it was written for Israel at that time, is also an origin story, period. So what we talked about tonight is absolutely going to be applicable to us. So let's dive in. Genesis chapter one, I'm actually not gonna do Genesis one. We've kind of heard that order on the beginning of the world, how it came about. We see a creative, artistic God who loves order, who has a design to what he's doing day one through day seven, each time he does it. And he loved what he created, okay? There was a rhythmic flow all through Genesis one where it's like he does it and he says it's good. And then he creates and he says it's good. And he creates and he says it's good. Also, one quick thing for you nerds out there that are like me. Um, Hebrew names are important. So Genesis 1, when Moses is writing it, he refers to God as Elohim. So when he says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The, the Hebrew for God, there is Elohim. And God really kind of like takes that term that would have been popular in that day for just a spiritual being and kind of like co-ops it for himself. Like in the beginning, Elohim, me, supreme creator, supreme being, I created everything. With spoken word, nothing exists and he creates it. So all the Genesis one, Elohim, 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 Elohim. When we get to Genesis two, Moses changes the term and he adds in Lord God. And that Lord is all caps, capital L-O-R-D. Anyone know what name all caps L-O-R-D is from our series last year? Oh, you guys learned. Yes, it's Yahweh. It's really interesting. Elohim is that powerful, supreme creator in control, dominant force coming into a world and saying, I'm the one, I'm taking full credit for everything you see. And then we go to Genesis two and we get Yahweh. Well, what is Yahweh? Yahweh's got that dichotomy of both. Yahweh has that compassionate, that merciful, that faithful, you are my people, this is my name, I am Yahweh. And isn't it interesting, Moses is writing this, he's writing with a name Abraham didn't even know God by. God gives Moses that name to take to Israel in slavery so that they know I'm coming for you because you are my people. I heard your cries and I'm coming to get you. So Moses takes that term back to Genesis two because he wants them to know Genesis one was about power, creation and order and authority. Genesis two, you're gonna see intimate God. God's gonna be intimately involved. How do I know that? Well, he spoke things all through Genesis one. How does he create Adam? He scoops up the dirt, right, with his hands. He gets down in there. He could have done it. He could have just said human. Would have happened. But he didn't. And so he, we see in Genesis 2-7, we see that he formed Adam or Adama, which actually means from the ground. It's like earth or dirt or ground. And Genesis 2-7 says, Then the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Also, that is so weird when you think about it, that there was a fully formed body that was not alive until God breathes his spirit into his nostrils, and then he becomes a human being. It's just, it's amazing. And what I love about this is just we see the living God is so intimately involved with creating Adam. And yet... Shortly thereafter, we see the words, it is not good for man to be alone. Now, we would expect this to happen, Genesis chapter three. We wouldn't expect to hear not good, Genesis chapter two. Prior to brokenness, prior to sin, and yet we do. We see that it's not good. 
and it breaks the pattern that had been all the way through Genesis 1, where it's good, it's good, it's good. So in Genesis 2.18, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, I want to be careful here. Um, very, this is a very, very common theory that when we, we hear the, the idea, it's not good for man to be alone, we can tend to kind of go, oh, Adam was lonely. But Adam wasn't alone, was he? Who was with Adam? The Godhead, right? Anytime we see ideas of, of human bodies that are described as God, who do you think that is? Jesus, right? Pre-incarnate Jesus. So fast forward Genesis 3. It says they hear God walking in the cool of the garden, right? So we can, we can assume from that that Jesus is in the garden. So Adam's not alone. He's with the Godhead. He's there with him. It's not that he's lonely. So then the connotations in Hebrew must be a little bit different than just it's not good for him to be alone. He's not alone but there's something about that word alone that insinuates he needs something. There's something missing, right? That's why it's not good. Can I tell you a theory I heard recently? I've never heard this before. It's obvious. It's one of those, you're like, duh, yes. But I heard it and I was like, oh, that makes sense. This rabbi was speaking and he said, the reason it wasn't good for Adam to be alone because there was an enemy in the garden. Satan was already there. So he's, it's not good for him to be alone against an enemy. Does that not make perfect sense? You're like, absolutely, absolutely. That, that makes sense, right? And this is how the story begins. Bringing male and female together as part of the stewardship of the garden in particular, but it was to contending against their adversary. And it's gonna take both of them, right? So, what we're gonna do, we're gonna take that verse, Genesis 2.18, and we're gonna look at that one phrase. I'm gonna make a helper fit for him. Some of your Bibles might say help meet. Some might say a suitable helper. It's phrased a little bit differently in each one. Most of them have the connotation of help, okay? So I wanna teach you about these two words. I think they're really important. They're gonna change our view of, of God's original different design for the woman, the original woman. So a helper fit for man is azer konegdo. Azer konegdo. Now, in the Hebrew, and you're never gonna hear me say it like this because it's so difficult to remember to say it, but it's like actually the way to say, I've heard it said ezer, ezer, all this kind of stuff. In the Hebrew, it's pronounced with a little bit of a tongue twist where it's like eitzer, eitzer. I'm gonna say azer, okay? Because it's just too hard to remember that. Um, another way to remember it is when you think of the word Eleazar, the name Eleazar, it's a azar, azer, okay? Um, this is a really good example of how our modern English culture views words very differently. When we think of helper, it's easy to think of like an assistant. We immediately might think subordinate, inferior, less than, like Adam just needed like a sidekick to kind of help in different ways. That's the way our, when we think of like a helper, you know, you think about like maybe you're outside like helping your dad with the car and he's like, hey, can you help me? Can you go grab me that wrench? And your only role is just to be like the, the runner that goes. And so hopefully tonight you're gonna see that it's like, it's not like that. But I mean, let me be real clear here. Many of our church fathers, ancient, ancient, thought this about women. I'm gonna read you just a few quotes because this is good to know how far we've come in our culture, okay? So St. Thomas Aquinas, Aquinas, in regards to the individual nature of woman, he says she's defective and misbegotten. And this, by the way, this is talking about the origin, the original design, defective, misbegotten. St. Albertus Magnus said, woman is a misbegotten man and has a faulty and defective nature in comparison to his. Therefore, she's unsure of herself. What she cannot get, she seeks to obtain through lying and diabolical deceptions. And so, to put it briefly, one must be on one's guard with every woman as she is a poisonous snake and the horned devil. So that's a fun teaching to sit through. Yeah, so St. Augustine said, St. Augustine, I love St. Augustine. He's got a lot of really, really good stuff, right? Um, I'm not trashing these men. This is just, I'm, I'm giving you a, a brief synopsis of how they actually thought this term lessened the value of women. That's what I'm trying to do here, okay? St. Augustine says, woman does not possess the image of God in herself, but only when taken together with the male who is her head, 
so that the whole substance is one image. But when she is assigned the role as a helpmate, a function that pertains to her alone, then she is not the image of God. As far as the man is concerned, he's by himself alone the image of God, just as fully and completely as when he and the woman are joined together in one. Just not true. Also, Augustine also said, what is the difference, whether it is in a wife or a mother, it is still Eve the temptress that one must be aware of in any woman. I fail to see what use woman can be to man if one excludes the function of bearing children. Hmm. Thanks, Augustine. Yeah, Martin Luther, reformer. He said, the words and works of God is quite clear, that women were made either to be wives or prostitutes. No gown worse becomes a woman than the desire to be wise. Fun. So the energy just got sucked out of this room. So everyone's like, I'm gonna stab Martin Luther. This was the culture of their time. Because the teaching was that women was less than, that we were inferior. Now, I chose, for sake of time, not to do any work tonight on the image of God issue. But I, I want to just really, like, concretely and clearly say, I absolutely believe woman is fully made in the image of God. In fact, I believe that we bear out and reflect the image of God differently than men. I think we have qualities and talents that are different. That's why there are times, biblically speaking, that God uses language about himself that sounds feminine. It's because coming from God, God is both. God is spirit, so he's not gendered either way. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying God has all the qualities. Every quality woman has, God has given to us because they exist in him. Every quality man has, God has given to man because they exist in God. God exists with everything. His character is full and he has bore that out. So we actually are fully made in the image of God just as men are. We bear out God's image perfectly, just as he intended to. We are no less than, we have intrinsic value and dignity all the way back to God's original design. Okay, good, we're done with that. Okay, azer means helper, aid, or strength. But, and I'm gonna show you, we're gonna read scripture tonight, I'm gonna show you how this is used. It's used 21 times in scripture, including the two that we see in Genesis chapter two. So helper, aid, or strength. But let me show you where it differs. It carries the idea of the helping party being the strengthener to somebody who needs to be helped. So like I said, if you take the example of the dad and the son, the son is not equal to the dad in that role, right? He is an assistant. That helper model, the dad's doing the work. This kid that's just getting the tools and fetching the tools, they're not equal in authority or role, right? For us, I wanna, we gotta switch that up and go, when God says we're a helper, he is not lessening our value or our dignity by calling us that. In fact, this word many other times when it's used in scripture refers to powerful help and extensive aid and it depicts military forces many, many times. So this helper aid and strength is strong. There is a strength to it that we need to see, much less than the fact that it makes us less than. That's just not true at all. And I promise you, that's not what God intended when he did this. And this is, I'm gonna show you why. I'm gonna read a couple of verses to you. And each time you hear the word help, this is Azair, okay? Listen to, to who it's talking about here. Psalm 3320, who says, we wait in hope, for Yahweh, he is our help and our shield. So God calls himself Azer. The people, Israel, refers to him as Azer. The second word we're gonna get to in a second. I'm just talking about Azer right now. So God is our Azer and our shield. Help and shield are not synonymous, but when they're paired with that and help and shield, it piggybacks. So how does God help us? Because he's our shield. They're, they go together. It's a strength. He's helping us because he's strong. Psalm 75 says, but I'm poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God, you are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. Again, God's the Azair. Deuteronomy 33, seven, it says, hear, O Lord, the voice of Judah and bring him into his people. With your hands, contend for him and be a help against his adversaries. As an Azair, God is called to contend for Israel, to come to their aid when they need him. Like a warrior, just one more from the Song of Ascent, Psalm 121. It says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord 
who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He will keep you. You will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. That's all connected to God's role as an azer. You know, God could have used a number of different words. There are other words for help that are generic terms for just help, just helpful. It's help, a helper. But he's intentional about picking this word. It's not good that he's alone. I'm going to make him an azer. Connecto. It's really intentional. Now, do not hear me say that women are equal in power to God as a helper. I'm not saying that at all, okay? I'm simply saying God's using this word because this is a strong word. There is strength in the role that the original woman occupied, and it was necessary to contend with the man against the enemy. From the beginning of the story, women were designed to come to the aid of her partner and contend. So we carry within us a strength that is unlike men, unique to us, and something we should be honored to use to lift up others. Now, don't think of being a warrior like what you think of in the movies, like you know the, the Greek warriors or the whatever, the big warrior, like the guy warriors. That's not what I'm talking about. I want, a different, I want you to think of a different view. A mama who stays up all night with a sick, crying baby, that's an azer. A single mom who has to get a job to support her kids, that's an azer. That takes strength. That takes integrity. That takes a lot. That's exhausting. But you know what? Anybody in here, you would do it if you had to for your kids. A grandmother who takes her grandkids in to raise them when she's already done that. And maybe she has her life ahead of her playing pickleball. (laughs) And then she gets the call. Of course she takes her grandkids in. She's an azer. A high school, college students who regularly look out for the needs of others, who look for the least of these to make an impact in their world, or they look to, to have a major that has purpose in it to give back. That's an azer. A woman who demonstrates sacrificial love to take care of sick parents. That's an azer. That's what I want you to see. I want you to see the strength in this word. I'm not gonna add a heavy burden on you that says walk out of this room and start being an azer. You're already doing it. I just want you to see it. I want you to call it what it is when you occupy that role of helper, of aid, of strength, and you come to the support of somebody who needs you, that's an azer. And it's beautiful. We are living in a time when it's vital that we help redefine what being a woman really is and then feel good about what we're called to and stand up for it. It's really important. Okay, word two is connecto. So this is the where they get the the idea of fit or suitable. That's the word we're looking at here. I'm gonna geek out on you for just a second because it's kind of cool. This word is what's called a hapox legomena. It means that, this is rare in the Bible. This is the only time this word is used. One time in the entire Bible. So it makes it really difficult to figure out what what it means. This is where you get translations like help meet or help or fit or help. They, They don't know how to do it. Like we're trying to find a meaning here. So they had to go to other languages they think the root words came from. So what I have found just from looking at this, okay, it literally means opposite in front of. It's not fancy. It's not artsy. That's what it means. Opposite in front of. Now that can be confusing, but so track with me here, okay? This makes sense when you kind of look at what it is to be like feminine or masculine and you see that we have a lot of differences. If you don't think there's differences between men and women, oh my gosh, I have so much research to show you. There's obviously differences. So I think we kind of get the idea of opposite. We, have, we, are, we are complementary and yet we are different. So I get that part. It's the in front of that it kind of have, it gives you a little bit of a pause. Like why, why is this word, why does it mean in front of? So I want you to think about a visual image of someone standing in front of you face to face, okay? Kind of blocking your path. So you've got a zare that's more side by side. 
and you've got connecto that is opposite, complementary, and in front of. And that's gonna be really important. Have you ever had to do this to a friend? Whether it's making bad choices, a friend, a husband, a coworker, or somebody, and you just kind of got in the way. We're like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Is this the best decision? Let's talk through this. That's connecto. You got in the way. You opposed when necessary. You with me? So Isaiah, come to the help of connecto, stand in front of. And it's gonna be really, really key, obviously, right? This is what this word means in a lot of other ancient literature comparable to the times when it was written. So that's where we get that. So women are not only intended to be a zare, we're also called to be connecto, one who stands in front of you and in the gap with you. The first two humans were designed to work and fit together perfectly, not just physically, in, in all ways, right? The strengths of one compensated for the weaknesses of the other. And the reality is, In Genesis, if we had spent time, we would see they were both given dominion. Both were called to rule and subdue the earth, not just one, both. What does this mean? It means that one was not complete without the other. That's why he said it's not good that Adam's alone. You need someone beside you to contend with you and someone in front of you to oppose you when necessary. It work, both roles are necessary for this relationship, especially because of the enemy they're going against. This is what a sinless relationship is supposed to be like. It's supposed to have mutuality, harmony. You're supposed to work together to accomplish everything. Now, some of us, even in this side of the world where we've experienced broken relationship, have probably experienced some types of relationships like this, where you did, you're like, this is how it's supposed to be. We're working together and it fits. And other times you've probably experienced just banging heads and fighting against each other. That's a result of the fall. We'll get there next week. Not next week, next time. Okay, so I wanna also be clear. This is not just talking about marriage. In this context, marriage is later. This is talking about how humanity was designed to work, right? Man, woman. So this isn't just a marriage thing. You're, you're called to do this in whatever network you occupy. This is an identity that you're called to live in, to come to the aid of people and to oppose when necessary. Yes, obviously, you can see that in marriage. It works that way as well. But this, this message is so much bigger. This is really for everybody. So what's the point? As we close tonight, I wanna bring these two words together and figure out what God is calling us to do and be in our world right now, right? So we can think about it again, Genesis 2, 18, I will make him an Azer connecto. So we're called to be both an Azer, walking side by side, helping and strengthening, and a connecto, one who stands face to face, holding you accountable and opposing you. And when we live in this rhythm with those around us, that's how God intended it. Now, the idea of absolute tolerance and that, that, that thing of, well, that's you. I'm, I'm not gonna judge you. I'm not gonna get in your business. I want you to hear me say, that's not biblical. We are called to be in each other's business with love, with grace and compassion, of course. But we're called to be in community as brothers and sisters in Christ and to put ourselves under accountability of a church body who holds us to a certain set of standards. We're called to do that in community. And within that community, there should be smaller communities, communities of small groups, of men and women combined, and communities of just women or just men, because obviously we can relate on the issues that impact just our one gender. We're called to be in each other's lives, to be a zero, but also to be connecto. Now I can bet in a room this size, some of you are like, I'm, I'm good with the Azer part, but the Connecto part is like, mm, that's not my thing. And others are like, I'm good with Connecto. I like a good fight. And if you need me, and you saw who they were, right? The certain ones that were standing up on, I'm not gonna tell you who you were, but like there are certain ones that are like, I need, that, that's who I need. Because can you just come? I like a good fight sometimes. I really, really do. It's, it's like a negative and a strength. When I'm using it like in the right way to like help people, it's good. And when I'm just like angry about it, it's really, really bad. It's, it's not pretty to, to see. Ask my husband, he'll tell you. But I believe tonight the invitation for us is to be both. 
It's to be both. As hard as it is. How many of you, I mean, I'm asking you to raise your hand. I am, okay? Raise your hand if you've ever had to deal with a confrontation, but at the end of it, it was so worth it because you drew closer to that person. Okay. It's hard, but sometimes we're called to wrestle with it and do it. In Hebrew, Adam will eventually name Eve Chava, and it means life. She's gonna be the life bringer and the life giver. In fact, cool little nugget for you. When Adam sees Eve for the first time, he responds with, this is at last, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, if you know Hebrew, I actually don't, so I just copied and pasted. Um, But this is what I read, this is poetic. So it's a poetic idiom, right? It's a word play where Adam responds with isha, which is the word for woman. And then he basically says, wow, this is one like me. Now, if you remember the story, before this happened, what had God brought in front of Adam over and over and over again? Animals, right? And he never said, wow, this one is like me. He named them, and then it was like on your way. So when he sees Eve, it's like, <gasps> wow, this one is like me. And he actually calls her a female man because she is a womb man, W-O-M-B. She is a womb man. Isn't that the coolest thing ever? Because she is going to bring life. That's why her name is Chava. That's pretty cool. We, everybody in here, we are forever attached to Eve's ancestry. So when we're reading this creation account, and we put that Middle Eastern lens on it, and we get in the context, we get such a beautiful historical cultural framing because we see how important this message was to the slaves, those women that were slaves coming out. This would have been the very, very first time they heard someone tell them that their creation was rooted with intrinsic value and dignity. That's huge right there. So from the very beginning of the story, we're the ones who brings life. And I'm not just talking about physical birth. I'm talking about we bring life with our presence, our energy, and our words, especially when we walk in the role of Azar Conegdo. We've not been designed to be subordinate or inferior. Now, again, reminder, we're talking about pre-fall, sinless relationship. We are going to open up the junk box later and get into all the other crap later. What I'm talking about right now is that beautiful original design before brokenness enters, the way God intended it to be. I would have loved to read more stories and watched, if we could, Adam and Eve interact with each other and rule and subdue the world the way God intended. I think it would have been really, really neat. We are complementary. Our strengths are good. Our design is different, and that is good. I think the reason that God waited until the end was to make that point clear. Not because Eve was more special or more valuable or more important than anything else. That's not what I'm saying. But she is kind of the pinnacle. She's the very, very last thing that God creates. And again, he uses his hands with her, right? Adam goes to sleep and God takes with his hands, takes out of Adam and forms Eve intimately because he loves her. We were designed as an equal and contrasting complement, Azer Konegdo, and when it was all over, what was God's word? It is very good. It was complete, it was very good. One last super important thing, and then I'm gonna play a video. How about the time just to kind of think through everything we've talked about and then let you talk, okay? I'm all for empowering us to walk out God's calling. But I know that some of you are doers and you're gonna hear a message that you need to do more tonight. And I'm gonna tell you, that's not what I have said. I am not trying to add a burden of go do this on your own. None of us in this room can perfectly walk out a calling of Azer Konegdo on our own. Guess who tried to do that? Eve. We're gonna find out next time how well that worked out for her. Spoiler alert, it was was not very good, okay? It's not good. So don't walk out of here with a, a newfound motivation. I'm gonna be an Azer Conecto because you're gonna fall flat on your face. We can do nothing without God. He is the Azer. What a blessing and an honor 
that the term that he uses to describe himself, he uses for us, that's honorable. But we cannot, we cannot be an Azer like God can. And we shouldn't even try. But we live on the other side of the cross, right? So we have the advantage of the Holy Spirit who comes in, who gives us the power to walk out this calling. So I'm not saying go do more, go be more, go think more, go try harder. Don't do that. This information is to go to your heart so you know your value, your dignity, and your honor the way God designed you from the very beginning. We had to start here before we turned the corner and went to anything else that dealt with womanhood. We start with God's design. And we only can walk in these roles imperfectly with God's help. But that's okay. Because God did not design us and call us to be perfect. His design's perfect. Because of the fall, we're not. We need him. And we'll get there next time. Let's pray. God, we love you. As we close tonight, we want to be clear that we are worshiping you, not some cool new idea of what it is to be a woman. We want to worship the creator. We don't ever want to draw our eyes down to ourself. We don't want to be thrilled with ourselves. We want to be in awe of you and the way that you designed us and made us differently and yet with purpose. You know us better than anybody else. You are the one who is our Azair. So as we walk out this new calling that we have kind of understood about ourselves, Lord, help us to always rely on you to give us strength to accomplish it and to accomplish everything you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.